We've now got another fantastic panel on specifically on the role of the WHO and COVID, an all-female panel, which we're really looking forward to, um, which should be exciting, and Colleen will be chairing that. Um, I forgot to mention earlier, this post-WHA, it's been put together by a team of us, so myself, Yasin, Colleen, Audrey, and Christian Kraft from Germany, who unfortunately can't join us on the actual post-WHA this weekend. Um, so it has been a team effort putting this together. And that, with that, I will hand over to Colleen. Thank you, Mike, um, and hello, everybody, um, again. Um, Thank you um, to the WMA leadership for joining us um, and for kickstarting our, our day today. Um, so I actually have a bit of an easier task to kind of follow on that and still keep on with the topic of COVID-19. Um, obviously, it is on everybody's mind. Um, also, um, very valid questions about COVID in general, uh, post-COVID, um, what do we do? Um, also for our patients who may not have COVID but have other um, health conditions where the delays um, in treatment are happening. All of these are very pressing questions. The interaction with antimicrobial resistance, which is a topic that is very dear to my heart as well. Um, very, very striking. Um, but we only have an hour, so we're gonna do our best um, to tackle some of the um, hot topics. Um, today, and one of them is um, WHO's response um, as well. So um, I have the pleasure to be um, moderating this panel, and I will be joined by two absolutely fantastic um, speakers. Um, so um, I'll introduce them briefly, um, and then we can get um, started. So I'll first start with Dr. Gina Saman, who's an infectious disease epidemiologist working at the WHO headquarters. Um, she is currently the COVID-19 country technical support lead within the headquarter um, incident management system. Um, prior to COVID-19, she had managed the implementation of the FIP framework, um, which is something that the WMA had been um, quite active um, in uh, participating and contributing to the discussions previously, um, and that's to strengthen pandemic flu preparedness. Um, she started her public health career as a surveillance officer at the Australian Department of Health, where she was a member of the national response team during the 2003 SARS outbreak. Um, so you can imagine that Dr. Saman has a tremendous experience and would be very happy that she's uh, taken her, the time of, out of her Saturday to join us. Um, we will also be joined uh, by another speaker, um, also another fantastic speaker who happens to be one of our own. So Dr. Paula Regis, who is an infectious disease medical resident um, and an epidemiology and global health researcher at Osvaldo Cruz Foundation um, in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Um, she has been working with global health and health diplomacy, um, heavily dedicated to youth engagement, empowerment and health literacy. Um, she is also a member of the WHO COVID-19 Clinical Management and Characterization Working Group and is the national coordinator for the World Health Organization Solidarity Trial in Brazil. So um, Gina and Paula will be joining us. Um, the way we're going to run this session is we're going to start um, with presentations, uh, first from um, Gina and then from Paula, and we will then open the floor um, to a Q&A session. Gina. Um, the floor is yours, and I'm happy to change the slides whenever you tell me to. Great. Hello, Kayleen. It's nice to see you face to face. And hello, everyone, colleagues. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Great. I dropped, I, I don't know why the audio on my laptop is not working, and I dropped my phone in a plate of hummus yesterday so now i have troubles with both um, so bear with me everyone if you lose sound I'll, I'll try to get you back somehow so thank you and i'm very uh, honored to be joining you today to speak on behalf of the health world health organization but also to be on the panel with paula who is one of the many unsung heroes for who who give their time diligently to lead trials in, in centers of excellence, to participate in clinical um, networks. So truly, thank you. And I, I want to present this slide deck from the perspective of WHO's mission. So our, and, and I think that helps tell the story better, because as you can see on the screen, WHO's mission is to promote health, 
keep the world safe and serve the vulnerable. And through this pandemic, and especially coming as an influenza specialist, where we're incredibly familiar with pandemics, this pandemic really makes our mission resonate heavily. Next slide, please. So a rapid update on the current situation. Uh, to date, countries have notified over 5 million cases globally, uh, of which uh, over 225,000 deaths have been announced. There are daily updates still ongoing from the WHO uh, epidemiological team, and these updates are available uh, on, 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 on the website. So if you would like more information on this, please do refer there. Next, please. If you look at what we do at WHO from the perspective of our mission, we promote health, we keep the world safe, we serve the vulnerable. And we have three key strategies in implementing our work through leadership, through driving public health impact in every country, and through focusing on global public health goods to again, work on impact. And our task today, and of course, uh, to, to communicate is how we, provide that service through COVID. So putting WHO's mission at work. Next, please. So in promoting health, next. WHO really has placed health at the center of the response, but also ensuring that the broader context is there. And by within four days of announcing the public health emergency of international concern, a fake, um, WHO issued a, a global strategic preparedness and response plan. And this helped catalyze national action plans. Uh, it helped trigger multi-sectorial action and it helped mobilize resources. So in terms of working at country level, we have 147 country offices in all six regions of our member states. Uh, working together with countries, we saw a massive increase, a 40% increase in a, just over a two month period in the number of countries that have national action plans to help orient their response to this disease. In addition, the work across the UN really galvanized and so WHO is leading the first time the UN crisis management team um, was, was mobilized under the UN. The Secretary General announced um, the formation of a UN crisis management team, and it's involving 23 UN entities working across nine areas of work. And this has then triggered the work by OCHA and others uh, to have a socioeconomic framework, a humanitarian, global humanitarian response plan, all of which place health services at the core of the system. In terms of mobilizing resources, close to $600 million were mobilized in three, three months. And of that, the majority has gone for country implementation and supplies. Next slide, please. In terms of supporting countries in developing these response plans and bringing the different components together, together you can see through the stories told in Romania and in India, in Laos, in different regions of WHO, that there is an enormous amount of work in this space. Now, 160 countries of 194 member states have national action plans. A number of others have said, we're not going to develop COVID specific plans, but are relying on their emergency response plans, broader emergency response plans, or otherwise health security plans. And that's reassuring because at the core of a response is really having a cohesive approach that governments collectively can, can work towards and incorporate best practices and approaches. Next, please. In moving countries together and, and having a voice on the science and evidence, which is in, of particular importance when we come to a new pathogen, is translating science and managing information overload. So through a platform we call EpiWin, we have a new way to translate science and manage infodemics, an overwhelming amount of information. A whole society approach working with uh, individuals, communities, faith-based organizations, youth organizations, and I believe, Kayleen, this is how we came to be in touch 
through EpiWin. And this, this body of work at WHO promotes health by tracking information overload, misinformation, and driving practical guidance on the, on the public health measures that are needed. So through this, a huge volume of risk communication products are out there, and a lot of this is available on the website. In addition, using amplification approaches through webinars uh, with lots of participants in many countries, this is a cascading approach to making sure that the most relevant uh, appropriate information is out to people who need it. Next. If we turn to our second mandate, which is keeping the world safe, let's have a look at what we do here. Next. So one of our core functions at WHO is driving data and analysis and having health information that's structured, that's informed by the, the official disease counts with it from countries. And we've received reports from over 215 countries, areas and territories, over 1.5 million records of case-based data of, of, of patients from 126 countries. So you can see that that volume of, of information, translating that into something that tells us um, the evidence to enable policy development is a huge body of work. And through that, we've shared over 100 global situation reports with regional platforms that speak more locally, with online dashboards that can enable users of this product to select country level data, regional level data, or otherwise the global information. And we also track public health and social measures to see how countries are using the data to inform the policy and measures that they're taking at, at the country level. Next. With our normative function, and I'm sure Paula will speak more to this in, in her involvement through these platforms, is to lead the policy and technical guidance development. So again, it's please don't imagine that we have a, a large number of people working on this in, in unilaterally. WHO has this incredible convening capacity and a consultation approach. For example, we steer through policy through leadership meetings, through our regional system, our country system. There are forums for global health leaders involving people like um, Dr. Fauci from the US and others who meet weekly to discuss high level policy ideas. Through our technical um, steering groups um, who have again regular meetings and who are convened to set the, help us set the agenda. By convening different groups of experts, We've had 96 technical documents published by WHO, including 55 guidance documents. And you can see in the boxes on the right, the different areas of work. And this has taken over 400 experts in a variety of different fields, over 100 calls. So you can just see the volume of time and people engaged in this uh, to, to make this happen. Next, please. And in particular of interest to this group is advancing clinical management work. So through having the clinical management guidance available and making it a living, living document, keeping up with the evidence, revising it, having toolkits for frontline workers to, to use, and then a feedback mechanism to inform it, as well as having educational materials on our, on our platforms to open WHO and the WHO Academy, and if you need links to those, please do reach out through Kayleen. We can definitely circulate those. And these are, these are available for everyone to use. And through that, a feedback loop to include in innovations. So there's a bi-weekly uh, call with knowledge and a knowledge exchange platform with clinicians that WHO hosts. There's a clinical data platform, which now houses over 13,000 detailed case descriptions for patients to again, help inform the science and the, and the evidence. And working with researchers to advance knowledge on clinical characterization and management. And without doubt, a big one is really pushing out oxygen availability to countries in need. Next, please. Another way to build the science and help keep the world safe by driving good quality policy and, and, and technical guidance 
is through promoting research. And these unity study protocols, if you've heard of them, were built around a concept that instead of commissioning one country to do a protocol or one group of researchers, here is a body of protocols that are standardized so that any country that's interested can take plug and play in their context and A, develop that science and, and knowledge for themselves, but then also to partake into the WHO global system and pool for, for a more powerful aggregated analysis across settings using our tools, using our uh, databases such as GoData to help pool and gather information more quickly. And as you can see at the bottom of the screen, 30 countries are now implementing some of these unity study protocols um, and 55 others are interested. And the majority of the countries participating, this is a very good, great thing, are low and middle income countries. So places where there may not be capacities to develop standardized protocols or the applications needed to drive and gather the data or manage the data required. Next, please. In addition, WHO takes the guidance, looks at the needs in country, and by focusing on country impact, scales up capacities. This is a wonderful story. The scale up of support in, in the African region to be able to increase testing capacity for COVID. As you can see, there's been a marked increase in a two month period of the number of countries who can test for, for NCOV. So there was a 16 fold gain in February alone. Two, we went from two countries at baseline to 32 countries by the end of February being able to test for COVID. And by, by about the mid April, the majority of countries, 94% of countries in the African region, there are 47 of them, have PCR testing capability. And as part of that process, four countries received their first ever PCR machines. And I mean, if you work in contexts, developed contexts, the US, Australia, where I'm from, I, this is really an, a, a very foreign concept to have your first ever PCR machine and knowing the requirements of biosafety that need to be in place, the training, the, the uh, consumables and supplies that need to be available. So WHO's role was really to enable all that process to be in place. And to do that with, within such a limited time frame, race against time in terms of procuring some of these supplies, getting it out there in a context where flights and disruption to supply chains was happening was a real massive effort. And all of the costs of, as you can see, 1.5 million a cost to WHO, but of course there are other resources from other stakeholders. But it just tells you the volume of work and making that all happen and also using the different labs within the region, people from laboratories from Senegal, uh, the lab in Dakar, from South Africa, um, from Ghana, were twinned with other labs in, in the region. And these are truly unsung heroes. So it's, it's an incredible effort catalyzing groups to help each other in solidarity. Next, please. So if we then look at serving the vulnerable, our third mission, next. This looking at how resources are used and a part of our strategic preparedness and response plan is this figure on, on the left, which shows you that as countries capacities and vulnerabilities get higher, so we go from level five high capacity to level one low capacity, as that goes up in terms of vulnerabilities and as the country's context for COVID increases, the idea is that we as WHO focus our energies there. So in terms of that graph, we try to focus our energies on countries operationally in that top right hand quadrant. And what has happened is truth has followed. This, this picture was exactly what was done of funds that we were received and those distributed to WHO country offices, and that amounts to $220 million as of May 10. The majority, 81%, were distributed to vulnerable countries, those in the top right quadrant. And all highly vulnerable countries received funds. 
But importantly, even high capacity countries received support. Um, and WHO is very proud of this. It's, it's a member state organization. And to be able to support all countries at time of need is in a way serving our countries, serving people at the time of vulnerability. And that's just coming from a, a resource perspective. Next. With, with essential supplies, as you are very well aware, I'm sure, the supply chains have collapsed. And, and this has meant that WHO and other UN agencies in, in partnership have had to bring together a supply chain task force uh, mandated under the UN uh, crisis management team established by the UN Secretary General. And this task force has catalyzed an incredible uh, effort to, to identify, negotiate, uh, secure supplies for countries. And so examples include providing PPE to countries where to a, over 110 countries, WHO has, has provided masks, gloves, gowns, etc. And we've shipped diagnostic kits to 127 countries that enabled over 1.1 million tests to be conducted. Next. In addition to that hard uh, operational supply, the resources of financial resources, WHO has also facilitated technical and search support. So through our, our platform GoOn, Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network, uh, WHO has uh, mobilized over 250 partner networks based in 77 countries to deploy to countries, be it on risk communication, be it on surveillance and outbreak response, having operational research conducted and using tools and apps that are being developed, including GoData and EpiCell. WHO's own staff were mobilized, and be it through virtual support, which in the current context is the mode of work, or otherwise through physical missions to countries. And we've been to 97 countries to facilitate technical uptake, technical support. These have been all areas of, of work. And lastly, to our emergency management teams, which are a, a which WHO, which WHO coordinate globally um, and engage different groups to provide the service. And to date, 20 EMTs have been deployed internationally, 500 teams have been mobilized nationally, over 11,000 uh, first frontline responders have been trained. And there's real evidence of solidarity in this piece where EMTs from different countries have gone to other countries to provide support and build on the, the lessons learned in their own national context. So this just shows that convening coordination platform that WHO provides as a service to countries. Next, please. And then with serving the most vulnerable, with, uh, if you're familiar with, with OCHA and the platforms of the health clusters and, and other clusters, we, we really focus a lot of our energies on the most vulnerable. And the UN has put together the Global Humanitarian Response Plan for COVID, uh, which was launched in March, later updated in May uh, to identify a set of countries, 63, um, that really do need the additional support and coordination and collaboration through the UN and other partners and really harnessing the, the capabilities of NGOs and national stakeholders to contain spread, to decrease deterioration in country and, and other um, uh, consequences of a pandemic, such as human rights, livelihoods, etc., and to protect and assist and advocate for those who are really truly vulnerable such as refugees and people on the move. Next please. All of that put together throughout our mission to promote health, to keep the world safe, to, save, to serve the vulnerable, we monitor a, a various um, sort of indicators that tell us and help us calibrate the response as we go along. As we see as of mid-May, there are opportunities to strengthen infection prevention control capacities, our event man events of based surveillance at country level. And this is a really important feedback loop to help countries and regional platforms, global platforms, all stakeholders involved to improve and, and continually calibrate the response. Next. 
with that, uh, let me again thank you for, for inviting me to this and just hopefully to say that this, this mission resonates highly um, and, and I think even more for the sake of unity and globality in a pandemic of a, of a new pathogen uh, where we're all learning together. With that, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Gina. So uh, we heard um, a lot about what WHO is doing. So really at all levels, starting from the global response and leadership um, on the political side, um, a very strong convening capacity, um, as well as um, a lot of hard work going behind the scenes, including um, many um, colleagues and many people around the world who are also um, involved and helping in WHO's mission. Um, I can certainly uh, attest to the fact that uh, a lot of uh, people are working and on calls uh, more than uh, twice a week. I'm on the IPC uh, expert group and we are talking about three hours twice a week, um, every week. Um, so a lot of hard work um, going on. And, and I think that uh, that is certainly something that uh, um, countries, um, people and um, frontline providers are, are actually seeing. Um, so uh, with that, I, I'd like to um, um, switch gears, well, not necessarily switching gears, but move to uh, hearing from Paula. Hey, hey, everyone. Thank you, Colleen. Um, I will not present the slides because actually I'm staying 24-7 inside the hospital and it's been a quite stressful moment for all of us, but I think that relating with what that Gina has said, mainly um, I will talk on a perspective, a kind of personal perspective and national perspective on how this convenient scene um, point of WHO is being experienced in our lives here inside the foundation and especially regarding all the clinical trials that we are conducting here. So um, basically, um, talking on an aspect of my involvement with WHO, as many of you also have, we are playing the role of a kind of consultancy. So exactly this point of being a conveniency and gathering so many experts from all over the world and with different backgrounds, different experiences, and especially providing voices to low mid income countries experts as well, because at a certain point, uh, what you see, and talking here, I know that on Brazil, we. Uh, we are involved with low middle income countries, even having so many social disparities. And of course that we have high qualities, but also low qualities of systems. And especially when talking about the health system, it's a quite hard uh, environment to deal and to kind of have a concise word that will work for the whole country. So um, as if the world is hard to find a one guidance and, and unique policy, it's also hard for a huge country as ours uh, to find a unique movement and unique guidance for it. So basically talking also about the political guidance and the political determinants of health, uh, it's been a quite challenging uh, experience and to be living here in Brazil because what we've been seeing uh, is that we have politicals prescribing drugs and not only medical doctors or people that are capable of doing this. So uh, especially regarding also the all the relationship between the government and the agencies and experts and WHO has been a quite tricky moment to be living in. Um, so basically talking about this whole clinical management and characterization group regarding the LHO. Um, as, as you said, we are having like weekly meetings uh, and the most important point is about gathering all the, the efforts on providing consistent and robust data. So basically this work that we have is like we have weekly meetings and we discuss um, all the highlights and main topics that are being discussed and run uh, around the world in terms of research, especially, of course, regarding to clinical management and how to characterize uh, um, this disease. We all know that how hard it is to, to find 100% sure in any of the questions that we may have because we don't have easy answers or easy points to convene. And so basically in this group, what we do is that we have these weekly meetings and we discuss the main topics, for example, uh, the use of corticosteroids, the, uh, how it's been uh, related to the news evidence regarding pediatric uh, patients, 
And in the end of the day, what we try to do is to um, make the communication between research, between institutes and people that are conducing similar research that they can work together and have better structure, have better ideas in a way of providing better data. Um, we know that as well, that we have never seen so many uh, new releasements and preprints documents and everything being released every single day. So the point about having this kind of short studs around the world is that you never have a perfect, and I know it's impossible to have a perfect panorama of what's going on all over the world, but we need more robust data again for doing that. So basically what we are doing in combination with WHO is fostering all these efforts and putting it together in not only one place, but specifically under one analysis so we can match the efforts and give and provide to all the researchers, to all the clinical field professionals, and especially to the whole population more concise answers. Um, the past, um, like we have meetings on Wednesday, so this past Wednesday what was mainly discussed were the new evidence regarding pediatric patients and the use of corticosteroids and how it should be seen. Uh, of course, always dealing with the past experience with SARS and MERS, but trying to produce new data regarding SARS-CoV-2. Um, so basically related to WHO specifically, is this the point? And I would actually like to raise a point because most of us, we are like young on this. Uh, even if we have experiences not that long, so sometimes we, I'm talking this on a personal side, so sometimes we always feel that there are people that would be more capable of doing that work, but what I've seen is that how much they value all the perspectives and how much is being important to have this insight on new professionals, let's say, that are trying to conduce and to manage the disease as we have never seen before. So if in certain fields we may feel, oh, I have less experience, actually all of us, we have lack of experience with COVID. So it's quite, I'm not gonna say, it's hard to use positive words, but it's been kind of good to see that everyone is in this together and is trying to like to produce data, to work together. So there is no level or distinction because of age or because of the years of experience in the field that will be like less listened or less valuable insight. So this is a quite good point. And I think it's important and empowering for all of us to see that we can do this and that it's important to have this combination of efforts. Um, so basically now turning to the point of what I'm doing exactly here in Brazil. Um, so you all are aware of the, the importance of clinical trials, of course, and that WHO has released in the end of March, the biggest clinical trial that they have ever proposed, which is solidarity. Uh, we've all listened how many times Tedros repeats the word solidarity and how this is important to the whole epidemic and to the whole pandemic to have this combination between um, economic efforts, political efforts, society efforts in terms of finding new ways of leaving all of this behind. So the solidarity trial is a clinical trial, a randomized trial, and it's important specifically because of this point of being randomized because We've seen many clinical trials and press and releasements and again preprints, but not all of them are kind of controlled, randomized, or have a big N, a big number of patients being involved. So the idea behind Solidarity Trial was exactly to gather as much and as many people as they would be able to. So, so far, what we've seen is that the Solidarity Trial has started in 30 countries, but they have the expectations to increase this number. Uh, and they have already put inside 3,000 patients all over the world. And we have so in all the regions, in all the WHO and the United Nations regions, they have participants. And this is quite important because it's also an adaptive kind of trial. So what does it mean? That you don't need to have all the, doc the drugs available to start the trial. So uh, as soon as you have all the drugs proposed that I will talk a bit about, uh, in your country, you are already available to include patients and to randomize these patients. So, so far we have like five main arms that WHO has proposed and the selection of these arms was based in evidence that was released and also in, in trying to find actually 
something that can impact immortality, can uh, reduce the time that the person needs ventilators, can reduce the time of like using ICU bed, and of course, uh, impact in morbidity in the future of this patient. So the five arms are, you have a control arm, which would be not adding anything else to what it's done in the hospital. So like basic support to the patient. The first arm is hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine. We know all of these stories around chloroquine and we maybe all of us, we have read like Lancet release it of yesterday on the combination of macrolides and uh, hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine. But what is important, like we have so far not a, a robust, again, data that it doesn't work. So it's important to have, of course, the whole idea behind the, uh, we need to, We've all seen, like I'm talking like about Trump and Bolsonaro, it's a political question and it's a political issue mainly here in Brazil because uh, what we've seen is that science and all this critical data is not being used to be uh, fostering the implementation of guidance and how this is going to be conducted inside the country. So again, that's why this arm is still kept in the stud and we are still waiting analysis on these 3,000 patients that have been included to provide, again, a randomized uh, under analysis and control the data on the efficacy and efficiency of this or not. So the third arm is lopinavir ritonavir, which was a drug used basically for HIV treatment. Then the combination of Caletra with interferon beta 1A. And the fifth arm is Rendemsevir. We have always seen uh, all maybe like all the releasements also around Rendensevere and the expectations on using the drug. Uh, we have like USA and NIH has released like pre-data, but not actually the formal we stood around it. So we can't compare and we can't read the model of this study so far. And we have a Chinese big cohort that uses Rendensevere and that it hasn't shown uh, a biggest difference on mortality. So Again, it's a lot of uncertainty. It's a lot of unsure comments. And that's why it's so important to conduce clinical trials on this because we're, we need robust data again. Like we cannot uh, prescribe or even try to do this without seeing in a positive way of testing and seeing this um, properly in daily life or in the day, in the routine of hospitals because um, also here, what we've seen is that like medical doctors, they prescribe, for example, Ivermectin, uh, Nitazoxanida, and all of that drugs without having a concise data or information about it, and especially not collecting data after they use. So they just prescribe, but they don't see the effect. So in the end of the day, there are a lot of and big prescriptions with anoxaparin and many other combinations of drugs, but you don't see the positive effect because you make such a huge combination and without a control uh, arm, so without any kind of control that is hard to provide and to give answers because if you do everything, actually you are doing nothing. So this is the main important um, point on solidarity trial. So, so far in Brazil, we have 21 sites all over the country as well. Um, as you know, as well, we are a huge country, so it's been quite hard to manage all the, all all the sites because one specific point that we have here is that we have different levels of the epidemic of the pandemic according to the city so there are cities like here in rio that we are facing a lot of cases um and so but there are other cities that they don't have that many cases or for example because of the weather and we are coming to winter right now there have more influenza um, cases than covid cases and this can convince to a lot of misunderstood into diagnosing that patient. So basically, uh, what we're trying to do is to combine as the same way WHO does with different experts is doing this inside the country and trying also to extrapolate this to other Latin American countries. Like yesterday was released that South America is the new epicenter of COVID-19 and Brazil has reached the second position on the number of cases and we are on six on the number of deaths. Um, and of course, we haven't seen so far this kind of um, basement on the line and the, and the proper um, kind of like the cases are still growing up. So we are still in the middle of the pandemic and that's why we are trying to do all the efforts that we can so far uh, in the middle of this. Um, but again, like I think that what 
all of us are facing is like the point if you don't like politics this is not the moment to be in brazil or i think in any place in the world because what well, we are facing exactly the importance of political determinants of health i think to all of the countries but mainly when you have a, a political guidance that is going against science it's quite hard to keep working because every single day you have a new challenge and and it's always based on science so for everyone that believe in science it's quite hard to work with people that actually don't so it's it doesn't make that much logic so it's every single day a new challenge and anyway i think basically this is the kind of sum up of what's going on here and this relation with who is being really important not only for the supply of ppes and ventilators and but especially with this technical guidance and this space of being a convening capacity and this kind of inclusion that we have, especially with a perspective from a low mid income country. Great, thank you so much, uh, Paula. I actually heard quite a few things um, from you um, very briefly to try kind of to maybe summarize a couple of points. Um, there is a big call for robust um, data for sure, which is essential. Um, this is challenging with this rapid nature of this epidemic. The solidarity trial um, has developed very quickly, um, quite a large study um, that is hopefully designed to give us answers that would be relevant to many people around the world. Certain uh, sometimes challenges on implementation, but obviously this is something that, um, that is expected. Um, WHO, um, with a strong power of convening again, um, and inclusion of, of um, young experts like yourself. And, and I would certainly say that the JDN is very proud to, um, to have one of its members on, um, on the expert group. Um, and uh, the inclusion of LMICs, but also um, of young professionals as well, um, that is uh, certainly something um, to think about. Politics, we heard from um, Dr. Um, George before this morning, well, this morning, earlier, an hour ago, uh, about the political determinants. Again, this is something to, uh, to reflect and reiterate, um, but uh, from a countryside perspective, from um, people implementing on the ground, um, it does seem like the, the relationship with WHO is certainly very beneficial. Um, so I think that uh, um, I will stop here and uh, I am sure we have quite a few people um, who may have questions or thoughts on, on what they heard. So I'm going to open the floor for questions. Um, we can do the same um, as we did for the previous session. So if you want to raise your hand um, on Zoom or if you would like to type something in the chat, um, we'll certainly be um, happy to take those questions and comments. So, so I have a question, Kalim. Um, first of all, thank you um, both Dr. Jean and Paula for the presentation. And my question would be like, uh, knowing that now the epicenter is moving into Latin America and most probably in, in some months or weeks will go also to Africa. What is the role of especially young doctors in all this COVID-19 situation? Because as Paula was saying, of course, we still feel like we don't have the expertise or we don't have uh, as much experience as uh, probably older um, professionals. So what do you think is, is, the, is the main role of, of the youth uh, and the young doctors around the globe, especially now facing these new epicenters um, in, of COVID-19? Great, thank you, uh, Pablo, for the question. Um, Paula or Gina, anybody would like to, yeah. to take this one on? Yeah, I think it's a super tricky question, right? Like to all of us, especially when we don't feel in the right place. Um, but I think we need to make the right place, like because of course there is a place for us and that it's hard to empower your voice and to make your position relevant to that stage. Um, so basically what I think, it's hard, I, I would say this, but I, I'm in a privileged position because I'm part of a foundation that really values 
all of our insights and all of our efforts and and having the opportunity to be where I am, it's quite important and valuable to all the work I'm doing because I do have both and people that really empower me and put in me and, and allow me to do my work. So basically I know this, it doesn't happen everywhere. So it's quite hard to streak on your position and show that you have valuable thoughts and valuable insights that will implement and that will be useful for everyone. Um, but as a you young professional, what I think that we have tools and the tools that we have is that we, we know how to communicate. We know how to be involved with all of this. Like we know how to conduct Zoom meetings. Uh, we know how to use social media and we, we do this in a quite easy way. So basically I think that, that one of the most important things that we can do is like to use this communication um, skills that we do have to communicate to our population because um, it's true like involvement of like social involvement that we can also structure the importance of being there and doing that not only on um, coming from the top to the bottom but also understanding that the whole population and the whole society has a decisive role in all of this pandemic so i think that using these tools that we have available and it's quite easy and common normal for us to use it's really empowering and, and I think it's a nice way of showing that we have a better relation with the population, we know how to communicate and that when we do this properly with all the skills that we have, we also like um, tag and kind of make a target like politicians and leaders of hospitals and clinical trials and showing that we are also able to do so. Great, thank you. Um, any other questions? I see a question in the chat, but anyone would like to take the floor as well. Maybe Kayleen, I can add? Yes, please. Sure, so I, I appreciated Pablo's question. I, I really enjoyed um, the Paula's um, words about her experience. And the first thing that Paula spoke about was about rising to the occasion, really, isn't it? It's no one's an expert in this particular disease. So we're all learning by doing. And I think to answer Pablo's question, this is exactly it. It's rising to the occasion, explore the areas that seem to interest you. is useful in the in this context i also think that it's an opportunity to set an example where with your level of energy i have no doubt you are able to keep up with some of the literature uh, the best practices that are encouraged to advocate to have the, the the localized networks and the global networks for that matter to engage and and really help bring that all together and i think that's that extra step of energy required is where where i think a young doctor can play a role over great uh, thank you so much uh, gina uh, absolutely i think uh, from my perspective i completely agree about finding uh, niches and um, a lot of us uh, as you can imagine come from backgrounds of student organizations where initially we were interested in anything and everything um, but uh, honing in and finding a niche uh, may be the next step towards um, kind of contributing further. Um, so I will ask uh, the question in the chat while um, I hope other people are thinking um, about their questions and comment. Um, so um, this question is for Gina. Um, what um, do you think can be done to get both WHO and countries better prepared for the next pandemic? My favorite subject matter, pandemic preparedness. It's my bread and butter. Um, look, there's plenty, absolutely plenty. We're actually working on ideas now of what are we learning as we're going along the COVID experience to help have a paradigm shift moving forward. And so things that definitely come to mind are the importance of whole of society. Will we see another severe catastrophic event like COVID in the coming years, we don't know, but this event has certainly shown the need for whole society response. And so it's 
just by passing of the day, I went past uh, the, one of the late WHO Director General's graves here in Geneva, and the tombstone said, health for all, all for health. And I mean, this, this fellow, this you know, amazing person died in the, in the 80s. And even then, that concept of whole of society, health for all, all for health, it was, it's, his, it's, it's on his tombstone. And so you just think, wow, that now resonates more than ever in my mind. So I think the whole society approach, translating that to move us forward in terms of pandemic preparedness, that airlines, cargo, supply chains, whatever it may be, the banking system, our economy, our social welfare and human rights systems, I can go on and on. How does that build into the health preparedness? You know, sort of we talk about the sustainable development goals, are we going to somehow need sustainable preparedness goals moving forward because of our interconnectivity and, and whether we see escalation of these types of events, I don't know. But that one comes to mind. The second is really thinking about the unknown. So we prepare in my world on, for influenza. So that's that, that baseline sort of need that we recognize that getting vaccines, getting antivirals, preparing systems and surveillance and driving that forward. But a disease X and saying that we have to prepare for something that we don't know and what does that look like generically. I think for clinicians, again, the concept of having these networks like the solidarity trial are revolutionary and then being able to say, well, what is our pharmacopoeia and how do we better build on this um, to, to work together in that solidarity. So these are some of the ideas, but it's, it's such, such a great one to get involved in and perhaps for you all to have a, a position paper yourselves on, on where you think this could go for, for the future as well would be very welcome. Over. Great, thank you. Um, so maybe another question from the chat um, to you, Gina, is, uh, maybe, is there a WHO strategy or guidance on um, meeting the rehabilitated have needs for cured COVID patients, so um, post ICU weakness, PTSD, um, etc. The clinical guidance document, as some of you may know, are currently being revised. So I, I believe some of this is being addressed in there. And as I mentioned with PTSD, the, the mental health management guidance really does emphasize this. So there is quite a set of, of guidance on this, uh, but please do have a look at the website um, or, or otherwise, Kayleen, perhaps write to me and I'll see what I can gather in terms of some inputs and bullet and send it round. Perfect, thank you. Um, we are two minutes after the hour, but if you don't mind, we may just go for another five minutes because we started late and I think that there'll be uh, more people interested to ask questions. So if everybody's okay, we're just gonna stay on for a few more minutes. Um, any other questions? Uh -huh. um, I actually know the answer to Leo's question, but I'm still gonna ask it. Um, um, so another question to Gina, does WHO provide guidance for countries in terms of decision-making and lockdown, release of lockdown and border closures? Yeah, look, thanks for the question. WHO does not recommend lockdown measures per se and border restrictions. Uh, the, the whole purpose is to have a suite of measures that countries can use, and there, are, there is actually guidance on this now, to say of the suite of um, uh, groups of measures and public health measures that can be available to a, to a national or subnational authority, local authority, depending on the epidemiology of the, of the outbreak there and, and the event there. Um, then there are, there are also indications for how to adjust those measures. And so in that sense, there is really a, build, a sort of buildup of body of work on this. Um, and the, the policy decisions are always at the national level. WHO is giving the guidance to say, if you go down this path, these are your considerations and these are sort of the things that you should be watching out for. What we're really emphasizing now is whatever you choose to do, you need to have a very high quality surveillance to be able to monitor, to see if that you have uptick of cases, then you need to tighten and apply more measures. 
um, and, and vice versa, so that you're always able to calibrate your response. Perfect. Thank you, Gina. Um, I see another question from Leo, but are, is there anybody who didn't get to ask a question who has something they'd like to share or, or a question? Okay, maybe I um, will take the, the second question um, from, uh, from Leo here. Um, you mentioned solidarity many times. Um, would um, the fact that you, the US government threatened to withdraw from WHO influence the capacity of WHO to provide um, support for developing countries? And uh, I'll just ask him, anybody who'd like to take that one. So is that to me, Kayleen? Sorry. Most, most likely, yes, I would imagine. Okay. Yeah, look, WHO is looking at the implications of member states withdrawing the, the support and contributions. Every time this happens, it's, of course, a, a real shake-up to how we can implement this and, and deliver uh, the support to countries. Uh, back in the 80s, WHO's funds were largely un- uh, un earmarked they were they were flexible funds in other words who had the capacity to say right these funds are needed for this particular disease or this particular activity and and that gave a lot more flexibility to tailor programs and uh, according to needs and it, now that that was the 80s now 80 percent of our funds are earmarked and so they, we have less ability to be flexible in where, where how to design and, and deliver the resources um, through, through, through WHO's capacities. Uh, so in that sense, it, it's a constant fine tuning. And I think this is always uh, in progress. We rely on other donations and, and contributions and the, the assessed contributions of member states themselves. So there is this constant calibration at, and it continues over. Great. Um, thank you very much. Um, so uh, um, maybe one last quick question um, also to Gina. Um, are there any WHO um, guidelines or guidance um, on um, the kind of um, the effects? Well, the non-COVID effects, but uh, malnutrition, increased mortality, maternal mortality, mental health issue, etc., that are developing um, from the consequences of COVID, um, be it um, economic, financial, but also kind of what uh, um, some colleagues mentioned before, delays in seeking medical care. Absolutely. You couldn't go into the WHO website now without finding mental health and COVID, uh, maternal health and COVID, immunizations and COVID, absolutely. There's a lot of documentation, guidance, advice, FAQs on how to adjust and tailor um, the delivery of other health, essential health services um, in the context of, of this event. So a great example here is something that, again, calibrating by monitoring our, our indicators. We, for 60, uh, 64 priority countries, which are the high humanitarian setting countries, 44 of the 64 have experienced disruptions to their immunization campaigns. So that 70% have had disruptions to immunization campaigns. And to then think of the consequences of that on health, if outbreaks occur of those preventable diseases, B, the socioeconomic consequences, because parents can't go to work, or, or the disruption to life and livelihoods. Uh, so all of that is, is definitely, in terms of how to minimize disruptions, is high on the agenda. The UN socioeconomic framework in response to COVID has five work streams. And the first one is placing essential health services at the heart of the response. So it's, it's really revolutionary for WHO to see this in the sense of health at the heart of a UN-wide response in this component is really excellent because it says you can't have economic recovery 
You can't have um, other prosperity and building back better without addressing your, your health services and, and maintaining your essential health services. So the answer is yes, it's, it's definitely available. Perfect. Um, thank you so much. And kind of maybe uh, as a segue and to conclude, um, if uh, anyone is not able to find any of the guidance um, that Gina mentioned on the WHO website or have any questions, please feel free to email me and I'm certainly happy to kind of relay um, all of that and, um, and help you um, get uh, the access to the documents um, that, that you need. Um, I think uh, um, we're probably um, going to close now. I would like to thank uh, both Gina and Paula for um, joining us for the um, very, very interesting discussion, very stimulating points and um, bringing up the tremendous um, amount of work that is being done and how we could potentially build on that um, so that um, you know, the world is stronger um, in, um, in fighting COVID. Um, thank you also for um, the JDN colleagues who, who have joined us um, today. Um, and um, um, I will turn it over back to Mike. Thank you, Colleen. And thanks, uh, Paolo and Gina, for their excellent presentations. We really appreciated that. Um, and thank you all for joining today. I hope this has been a valuable and enjoyable session, um, despite the fact that we're not able to gather in person this year, like we normally would in Geneva. It's been great to see so many faces from around the world, all talking and connecting on issues of global health that we care about. Um, we have the po virtual post WHA continues tomorrow. Um, so I hope that as many of you as possible can join us. We have two sessions. So we have a session on digital health with experts from the UK and Estonian governments speaking on digital health and particularly in the context of COVID and the digital health transformation. Um, and then Yasin and I will be doing a final wrap up session on critical analysis skills for understanding global health policy. Um, and we look forward to you joining tomorrow. We will be sending out a web link to that with joining instructions just before the webinar, like we did today. Um, we have got recordings of the sessions from today. So if you've missed something, as long as we have permission from our speakers, we will share those and make those available to JDM members uh, after we've finished editing them. And have a lovely afternoon, morning, evening, wherever you are in the world.